Good afternoon. Welcome to the Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focus Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology webinar. To formally open our virtual event today, here is our Pistifoog President, Dr. Filomena S. San Juan. Good afternoon. Warm greetings to our participants in this Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focus Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology with concentration on high full application in obstetrics and gynecology. This is the Society's maiden webinar whose main objective is to raise awareness on the availability of a new non-invasive uh, treatment in the management of common disorders in gynecology, such as myoma uteri and adenomyosis. These two conditions affect and decrease our women's quality of life, as well as uh, the, in her lifetime. Focus ultrasound surgery is an emerging non-invasive method of thermal ablation through localized application of high intensity ultrasound to affect coagulation necrosis. Focus ultrasound therapy is a disruptive emerging non-invasive treatment of many ailments such as fibroids, adenomyosis, Parkinson's disease, benign hypertrophy of the prostate, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, osteosarcoma, and breast tumors among others. Today, it is my honor to welcome you all in this webinar intended for obstetrician gynecologists. This webinar is brought to you through the sponsorship of SNS Corporation and the Philippine Society 
of therapeutic high intensity focus ultrasound in OBGYN, as well as BioFarm UAP uh, that provided our platform tonight. Let me thank our CME committee, our moderator, Dr. Marilu Yu De Vera, and our speakers, Dr. Ising Lee, Z. I. Lee of Shanghai, China, and Dr. Raymond Setzen of Johannesburg, Africa. Let's sit back, relax, and enjoy this webinar. God bless and keep safe, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. San Juan. And to start our scientific lectures, here is our moderator and host for today's webinar. She is the immediate past president of the Philippine Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology and Fistifo Ogs Treasurer, Dr. Marilu Yu De Vera. Thank you very much, Mr. Grasal Salvaleon, Ms. Tina Pangan, and BioFam for the IT team. Good afternoon to all attendees and participants from the Philippines. Shanghai and Chongqing, China, the UPE University students from Asuncion, Paraguay, the Asia and the Pacific region, and everyone from Johannesburg, South Africa. It is my honor to take part in this first ever webinar on HIFU application in obstetrics and gynecology, headed by the Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focused Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, in cooperation with Chongqing Haifu Medical Technology Company Limited. To formally introduce the Board of Trustees for the Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focused Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, the President is Dr. Philomena S. San Juan, the Vice President, Dr. Regina Rosario Panlilio Vitriolo, Dr. Erlidia Llamas Clark, Dr. Maria Ana Luisa Dalawambayan, Secretary and Assistant Secretary, respectively. Treasurer and Continuing Medical Education Coordinator, yours truly. And members, Dr. Lara Marie Bustamante and Dr. Catherine Irene Medina. Our learning objectives for today are the following. At the end of this webinar, we shall understand the high flow application in obstetrics and gynecology. Second, Know the Shanghai China experience in treating adenomyosis using HIFU application. Learn the South African Afri experience in treating myoma uteri using HIFU. And lastly, compare the treatment outcome for adenomyosis and myoma uteri using HIFU and different modalities. For our house rules, let me remind you of the following. Participants other than the speakers are muted. Kindly send your questions via the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed during the open forum. Kindly answer the evaluation form after the closing remarks. This webinar will be recorded for future viewing. And of course, thank you for your cooperation. For us to understand the non-invasive procedure, that is the high intensity focused ultrasound, allow me to give you the informative videos on what is a HIFU machine, how the high food treatment goes, as well as how to navigate the machine. These videos are from Chongqing Haifu Medical Company Limited. Take it away, Russell, for the videos, please. An ultrasound beam can be brought to a tight focus at a distance from its source with sufficient energy concentrated within the focus. The cells lying within will be killed without damaging the surrounding tissues. High intensity focus ultrasound HIFU, is, therefore, a non-invasive method of producing selective and trackless destruction of deeply seated tissue targets within the body without causing any damage to the overlying surrounding tissues. Ultrasound guided HIFU involves HIFU ablation under the guidance of real time ultrasound imaging, which can achieve an uninterrupted visualization of tissue cogulative necrosis during the treatment 
via grayscale changes in real time. The ablated lesions demonstrate an echogenicity or grayscale changes in the ultrasound images after the sonication, which enables immediate assessment of patient's response to ablation, ensuring a safer and more controllable therapy. Imaging fusion and three-dimension digital reconstruction function provide doctors with a much clearer vision during the whole procedure. Thus, doctors can finish the treatment with an ease. Ultrasound Guided HIFU, a new option for the gynecologist to manage uterine fibroids and other gynecological benign tumors, can maximally preserving the integrity of the uterus. No surgery, no bleeding, and no anesthesia. The Haifu knife applied with FUS focused ultrasound tumor therapeutic system allows in vitro ultrasound to enter the body and focus on the lesion, killing only the tumor without destroying any healthy tissue. It doesn't cause a wound or the loss of blood, and patients usually make a quick recovery after treatment. So how, by a few clicks of the mouse, does a doctor finish the treatment? As an example, let's see how the treatment of uterine fibroids is accomplished in five simple steps. Step 1. Locate the fibroids. Unlike a laparoscope, which via hands-on operation reaches and views the fibroids, the Haifu knife uses B-scan ultrasonography to find the fibroids including those a mere one or two centimeters in diameter. Now, B-scan probe starts to move from the left side of the womb. Good! The left border of the fibroid is shown. Then we record its coordinate, plus 30. Then move the probe to detect the fibroid's right border and record its coordinate, minus 20. That's how we find a five centimeter fibroid and determine its position. Step 2. Make a treatment plan. A computer will help us plan out how to kill a 5cm fibroid. This process is like cutting a potato in slices, except that it's done via a computer. Step 3. Contrast Enhanced Ultrasound. Contrast agents are injected to determine blood perfusion, to estimate the level of difficulty in treatment, and to distinguish fibroids from normal tissue for comparison with the result of post-treatment contrast enhanced ultrasound. Step 4. Treatment. Wait a minute before pulling the trigger, we need to make sure of four things. The proper condition of the patient, a safe acoustic pathway for ultrasound free of intestines, a safe water level and temperature. Focus the point of the Haifu knife aimed right at the target. Done. Now we can begin the treatment. Choose an appropriate degree of treatment, i.e. degree of thermal power and destroy the fibroid slice by slice according to the treatment plan we made in step 2. Now that the fibroid has been killed, all the patient needs is a few painkillers as well as some music and movies. And there's no need to worry about B-scan ultrasonography images because our product is equipped with both 3D magnetic resonance imaging and B-scan ultrasonography to achieve precise positioning and treatment. Step 5. Second time contrast enhanced ultrasound. Apply the contrast agents once again and we will find that the place where the fibroid once existed is no longer highlighted, which means the fibroid has been totally eradicated. That's the end of a successful operation. Isn't it easy and lovely without all the tiring procedures? Even though curing diseases is our duty, we do deserve a pat on the back from time to time. After the operation, nurse the uterus for two hours by cooling it down. Then the patient can begin having water, food and moving around. She will be able to return to work in three days. The residual fibroid will be cleared by the immune system. The patient will be able to get pregnant three months after the operation. The Haifu knife means hope for patients and is an important option for doctors. To learn more about the Haifu knife training program, please follow us on our official WeChat account. There you are, and I hope the videos gave you a visual appreciation of what we shall deal with this afternoon. For those of you who just joined us, welcome, and I am Dr. Mariluyu De Vera, your moderator, and you are about to hear the experts in OBGYN HIFU application from Shanghai, China, Johannesburg, South Africa, and our very own Dr. Philomena San Juan, 
Thank you for joining us despite all the challenging times that we are having. With God's grace, together we shall overcome this pandemic. Before we get started, let me remind you that we got the chat box as well as the Q&A icon. You have an opportunity to type in your questions for the speakers and we will address this at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your understanding. I would like to introduce our first speaker from Shanghai, China, Professor Ising C. Ai Li. She is the head of the Haifu unit, the first affiliated maternity and infant hospital of Tongji University, deputy director of the endometriosis group under the Shanghai Medical Association of Obstetrics and Gynecology, member of the minimally invasive and non-invasive medicine committee under the Chinese Medical Doctor Association, honored as the women pace setter of Pudong District in the year 2013 and 2014, acknowledged as one of the top 10 angels of maternal and infant care in the year 2016 and 2017. To talk about Haifu application in adenomyosis, the Shanghai China experience, Please welcome Professor Ising C. Ailey. Your floor, Professor. Good evening, all my friends from all over the world. On this special circumstance of virus time, <clears throat> life is not easy for all of us, especially for all people who work in the front line. No matter what is happening, we as doctors should never stop sacrificing ourselves. Like today, we are still learning something. It's my great honor to be here to share some experience about high food treatment. This is the place I am staying now. I'm from Shanghai, the first maternity hospital. This is the beautiful Shanghai. And uh, I hope in the future, sometime, you can come to visit us. Our hospital was built in 1947. It's already a very old uh, hospital compared to some new hospital. At the front of this building, I'm sitting on at the moment. There are some official information about our hospital like uh, the history and we have two campers. I am in East Campus now and uh, we have a uh, two huge building and a huge area and our hospital in many medicine uh, scientists also located in a very high level in China like National Nature Science Foundation of China, recent several years, our hospital in the top one. Our hospital is famous for obstetric mainly. Every year, every annual delivery quantity nearly 30,000 case. And this is the obstetric team. The hand of obstetric professor Tony, I believe many of you can meet him before. And for gynecological team, the hand is Professor Wen Xiaoping, who is full of ambition. He wants to create the top women's hospital in China. And the information show our Haifu cases rank to number one in Shanghai. But myself, I think there is no comparability because many hospitals still don't have Haifu equipment yet. We have many good teaching research and the clinical education also very well. This is a telemedicine big data center. When we do every cases, we will connect with them and keep every patient's very standard procedure and keep patients safe. This is the data from 2019. So from here, we can see our hospital in stand third level. Every year we uh, finish the nearly 500 cases. Beyond 1,000 cases include the Swinning Center Hospital. May, many friends already visit there and know the high full knowledge. 
The second hospital is Third Xiangya Hospital of Central South University, which is also a very famous hospital in our area. Like the Xiangya Hospital, the high school uh, in charge by Professor Xueming, who is an all around the very top lady, except Tai Fu. She is also on the top of robotic surgery. We are on the third level now, but I hope we can come to the first level. I want to quote the, the message from Zhong Nanshan. Choosing Tai Fu may be an accident, but once we choose this and make the decision, we will treat the patients with lifetime, loyalty, and enthusiasm. Very important thing to keeping one new technique. The loyalty and enthusiasm both are very important. So we begin from zero. Now, beyond 1,000 cases, we get a very long journey from 2050 up to now. The main cases we done include myoma and adenomyosis. Especially our research direction focus on endometriosis and adenomyosis. Like adenomyosis, the very important thing before doing HIFO, the types is very important. Up to now, many the doctors like to use uh, the types created by uh, Japanese doctor. These four types include type 1 is intrinsic, type 2 extrinsic, external, and 3 intramural. Type 3 like teardrop deformation of the rectum. And another uh, type staging system also accepted by many doctors include the diffusion endometriosis, focal adenomyosis, and the polypoid adenomyosis and other form. MRI classification recently um, can be used by some doctors. It includes internal adenomyosis, adenomyosis, and external adenomyosis. Internal adenomyosis include A to D. A means focal or uh, multifocal adenomyosis. B means superficial asymmetric. C means systematic adenomyosis. D e is diffusion asymptomatic. symptomatic. And E symmetric adenomyosis. A little bit complicated. And the second types from F to I. Solid, cystic, submucous, and subserious, little bit similar like myoma. External adenomyosis include posterior adenomyosis and the K respectively with posterior and anterior deep adenomyosis. Uh, recently, we uh, put forward our research about the type classification. The first, we based on the traditional classification for cone and the diffusion, and then divide into A, B, C. A means internal, B means external, C intramural, C means diffusion. Let's see the type 1, focal type, 1A. That means junctional zone boarding. There is no more muscular layer between junctional zone and the serous surface. Type 1B, there is no more tissue we can see between lesion and the junctional zone. And the lesion in with the uterine serous. Type C means there is boundary between intramural adenomyosis and the normal tissue. Diffusion type seen for A, lesion diffuse throughout the uterus and the junctional zone body. But there is no more muscular layer between junctional zone and the serosa surface. For B, lesion diffusion throughout the uterus and the invasive uterine serosa. 
but there is normal tissue between uterine cavity and junction also. This one maybe is good for pregnant again. Type 2C means lesion completely invade the junctional zone and the uterine serosa with diffusion throughout all the uterus. When we do the treatment, we divide it into three steps. First step is hypo. Second step, like we already know, endometriosis and adenomyosis is curable, uncurable disease. Also a chronic disease similar as like a asthma and uh, some chronic uh, disease. So the second step, we usually use some different medicine. The very popular one is GnRH, as our, all we know. We usually use GnRH with rapamine, uh, it's just to uh, keep the patient feel comfortable. The second very new medicine in China is dinogestum. The third one is a very old traditional medicine we call mifepristone. And the fourth one is gospel acetate. It uh, comes from plants. Also the very good medicine to stop the menstruation. The third step is marina. This is a paper we published last year about our treatment experience. This is the best work of art. This is a very um, typical adenomyosis, we will see. The first picture we can see the adenomyosis mainly occupy the posterior wall, the whole wall. And the second picture we will So I always call this our best work of art. The third picture we will see just after 80 days uh, happened a very big change. The huge uterus has miraculously regained its beautiful form after non-invasive gentle So the patient lies down and we will let the nurse clean the abdomen. The first step. The second step, we will measure the size of the lesion also measure the blood supplement. We dry me. So the MRI also very important guide. And the third step we will say through ultrasound we will keep the patient in very good position. We will see the bladder. Bladder is a very important organ during the hypo. Zoom. So we will see the ultrasound penetrate through bladder, focus on the lesion. We will find a safe and a sensitive area to begin. So usually the very important thing is the first step. So we will find a good, very important area or good area and uh, put the ultrasound, the source in, inside of the, the lesion. And then we will get a good result. We will see the grayscale change inside of the lesion. So this is sometimes depending on we should have very good head. So this is a case we done just recently. The first second, it's very useful. Happened. We can see the first second has coming. Here is some data from our research. The first thing, the pain related with patients' quality of life. We will see the VS and the VRS score compare 
before and after hypotreatment dramatically reduce. After three months, six months, and uh, 12 months, keep very stably. Same as localized adenomyosis and the diffusion ones. Here is a menstrual volume score compared before and after hypo treatment. Also, we can see the same two types are the same. The second thing, except the pain for, for the patient worry about is the heavy menstruation, hypomenorrhagia. So it's very good after high food, the patients can have a very less menstruation or normal menstruation. The third change we can see here, hemoglobin also can change dramatically. This is a third problem except the pain and the heavy bleeding is the hemoglobin. So we will some patients from rural village, the very severe situation come to our hospital. Sometimes it's very hard to treat. And the third thing is the uterine volume. The uterus can change dramatically. We already showed the, our best work of art. The uterus can change very well to normal. The five good thing is CE125. This is also up to now the very important tumor mark to evaluate the degree of adenomyosis or endometriosis also can rule out some malignant evidence. So here we can see after treatment, three months, six months, the one year, the C125 can reduce gradually to the normal level. So we get the conclusion, the three-step approach of high food GNRH and the MARINA is a very useful technique. Is a lower risk of <coughs> hysterectomy. The second thing is also very safe, effective, and efficient. The third, it can improve the quality of life, especially for patients with localized adenomyosis. So I will show some of the specific cases we done the last several years. The first one is very the uh, best one I already showed in our paper. So pre hypo one day after hypo and 80 days after. So we will compare it, see, it's changed to normal. Is that like a magic? The second case is another huge root uterus here, adenomyosis. One day after hypo, we will see it's a heart shape uterus and the three months later we will see the shape of the uterus coming we will compare so from here this is a three months change also very beautifully so what we will do for the right side of the picture we will see some something still inside of the uterine cavity so the step three we will do DNC, but we did not do directly, we will throw hysteroscopy. Like does not take hysteroscopy, we will see inside of the degeneration tissue. The right side of the picture, we will see the very clean, beautiful uterine cavity. The so tissue pathology result is high grade degeneration. This is uh, also the evidence to rule out the uh, malignant disease. And recently, we also um, find a very good method to, re to resection of endometrium. This video to show we do the resection for anterior endometrium. The second one is for anterior endometrium. So all we know adenomyosis and don't know adenomyosis, the main problem come from uterine cavity, the endometrium. So for those patients wouldn't like have baby again, no any desire for 
pregnant uh, after nearly 55 or even 40, we will do this procedure. Can destroy the all endometrium. We call it soft treatment. So no menstruation and no adenomyosis. Uh, except the adenomyosis, the very useful treatment uh, for hypo is leomyoma. Diffusion uterine leomyoma. All we know, diffusion uterine leomyoma, DOL, is very difficult to treat. I meet a patient, she already done five times operation, open, laparotomy. So herself did not marry and uh, her whole family nearly crazy for operation. So for DOL, the uh, operation is not the best choice. And uh, also the big problem for the patient wouldn't like to do the From this picture, we will see the right side picture is before Haifu. After four months, we will see the uterus come to a little bit uh, smaller. The fourth case is also the big adenomyosis. One day after Haifu, we also can see heart shape ablation area. Six months later, smaller, and uh, 16 months post uh, change a little bit normal, but the less a little bit coming again. The case five also the severe dysmenorrhea for five years, also adenomyosis. But after ablation, we will see mostly the lesion already uh, ablated very well. The case six is uh, also the diffusion DOL, diffusion uterine leomyoma. This is a very young lady, only 29 years old. So one day after Haifu, we will see mostly all the myoma ablated. And three months later, we will see the uterus coming smaller, much smaller. The case seven, also a myoma, four years of menorrhea, and we will see here the big myoma under the posterior wall. After one day, we will see the complete ablation, and the three months, we will see the myoma already is very small, nearly can neglect it. The case nine, also the best work of art, one of the uh, myoma representative, the good effective treatment result for HIFU. This patient also had a menorrhea for two years. It's a myoma type two, vaginal bleeding for six months. And we do the HIFU very beautifully. So we will see the result is very good. The myoma type 2 is also shrink the very well. We will see in the right side picture, the myoma shrink to the nearly one centimeter. It's very easy to do the hysteroscopically move out. Case 10 is myoma type 3. So from here we will see uh, after high full, five months later, the uterus coming normal. This is very good result because the myoma is uh, screwed out itself, no need to do hysteroscopically. Case 10 is a myoma type 4, intramural myoma. So we will see after one day of high full, beautifully ablation. Eight months after, we will see smaller much smaller. And the case 11 for multiple myoma. This kind of type may be very common in our clinic. So this is the big myoma here, anterior, posterior, area the myoma. So before I full, we will see the huge you chose the fundus nearly to umbilicus level one day after high full, and we will see three months later shrink to smaller, much smaller. So we will see 
lower than the umbilicus level here. So the patients nearly near to menopause, so not, no necessary to worry about the myoma now. Now the menorrhagia, so the menstruation is normal now. So case 12 is DUL again, so this is a very hardest one. After treatment, we will see the normal uterus coming here. So we will see the big uterus shrink normal size of uterus. So third 13, I will share high food to treat C-section incision pregnancy. Also the very interesting cases. Here is a embryo position. Right side picture is MRI. So we will see after high food, the surrounded embryo already uh, bleeded very well. No any blood supplement. So after high food, three days or two days is okay. We will do hysteroscopy. We will see the embryo inside the, of the uterine and we will do the suction. Can pull the, all the tissue out. The 14 case I will sh share placenta and creta. This is uh, also the big problem in China because we have so many patients had a C-section before and the when they have a second child is easily happen. So the first picture we will see the placenta here. When they post the high food, we will see mostly ablated. And the four months later we will see the normal beautiful uterus coming again. So not necessary to the hysterectomy. Case 50, I want to share a few of the cases. So it's not the all myoma can be ablated by HIFU. This is the cases we done um, two years ago. So we will see here the very shining signal here. One day after HIFU, actually we will see it's not too bad. The, the result is still is okay. The ablated area is enough for the, the myoma. But 23 months later, we will see it's come again. So we think for this type of myoma, it's not suitable to accept high food treatment. Last case is really a happy ending. The first high food baby in our hospital. We will see from the right picture, there is a big myoma near, nearby the cervix. And the, this lady, when the pregnant, like nearly 30, she accepts the MRI examination for the baby. Then we focus on the myoma, it shrinks smaller. So that is very nice for the uh, patients with myoma to pregnant. So myoma is not like not like as usual, if, you, if the patient did not accept high food, so myoma can grow with the baby, but after high food, it can stop growing or even can shrink gradually. So this lady is our first baby. So we always holding the, the human first idea. We established the Caring Uterus Club in Mandarin we call Ai Gong Ji Le Bu. We are holding the spirit of human first. We established the Caring Uterus Club to help those patients who really want to keep their sick uterus, especially multiple big uterus very severe diffusion, adenomyosis. We have many ladies. They wouldn't like accept hysterectomy. They want to keep their uterus. So we um, established many uh, WeChat group like uh, caring patients. The step one is WeChat. Like in China, WeChat is very popular. The patient can give us any information when the uh, uh, happen. 
So we will give the reply anytime. So recently one patient said uh, they feel the harmony, the friendly the relation between doctors and the patients. They feel so amazing. And uh, she said, managing emotion well is a good medicine to overcome the disease. So very important thing to keep the patients in the very uh, normal uh, emotion. So this is our the 1000 hypo baby. Also the very beautiful babies here. So the patient said uh, in our clinic can kill the disease and kill the heart and also can beauty convince love, but I'm not sure it's right. And uh, here he, she said, the medical skill is uh, equicide and the beautiful and the harmony. So the patient gives us confidence to move on, to do the, the more to improve our technique. So up to now, we have many uh, medical platform. We call a multiple self-media platform to serve, to help the patient. In China, a very popular one is Good Doctors Online, We also create uh, many specific special group to specifically to help the patient, any question. So this is a cake. And also I have the patient, she made this PowerPoint, this, this slide. She said that the pain um, and the sick and calm and live. And that she means the disease is very pain. She has a very severe adenomyosis. So as a doctor, you should feel something same as the patient and uh, to find a very correct and a very good way to help patient. The second day is sick. And she said she sick many hospitals, many doctors, and finally find me. She feel me like angel, but I don't think so. The third step is calm. Actually, it's kind of in uh, in China, the Mandarin Wu is means many things, very deep meaning. Is you should think something very deeply. The first step, the first is to live. You try to live well with a very higher quality. So this is a beautiful lady. Also, she is uh, the doctor also. So the trust of patients and the peer is the driving force for us to move forward. This is a painting from my my youngest son. Uh, here she we can see the crystal inside the uterus protecting Uterus may defend the dignity of woman and creating more harmony life. Uh, this is my high full team. I have uh, several assistants. They are very well. And uh, I also have very three big and great women in my heart. First is my mother, very gentle, kind, and uh, very brief lady and she has five child including me i am the youngest my biggest brother living in istanbul and the second lady is our very famous pioneer professor lin chiao zhi who created and established peking union hospital and cultivate my phd supervisor Professor Lang Jinghe, also an uh, amazing hand in our house, uh, whole China. The third is Mother Talisha. I want to use her words. We can't all do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And welcome to Shanghai in some time, no any virus. I hope everyone stays safe and uh, healthy during this difficult time. See you in the future. Have a very nice day. Good night.
Thank you for that beautiful lecture, actual case presentations, which were addressed by high food therapy and your personal accounts, particularly your family. What I admire is your presentation of failed cases too, as well as happy endings. We keep our fingers crossed for a caring uterus club in the future. Perhaps, Professor Eiley, you can adopt the Filipino OBGYN specialist to join in your club. This is indeed a very enlightening Shanghai experience. Congratulations on your 1,000th Haifu baby. Thank you, Professor Ai Sing Si Ai Li, and thank you, Shanghai. We shall address your questions later in the open forum. Now we move to amazing South Africa, particularly, particularly Johannesburg. Our next speaker is a dear professor who gladly accommodated and taught us a lot during our beautiful stay in South Africa. And for that, we are forever grateful to him. Dr. Raymond Zetsen is a consultant and head of HIFU unit at Chris Haney Baragwanath Academic Hospital since 1986. Also the vice president of the International Society of Minimally Invasive and Virtual Surgery. He is particularly involved in gynecologic oncology and surgical management of morbidly adherent placenta, percreta in particular, using resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, otherwise known as the reboa. He participated as a speaker and trainer in numerous national and international courses, conferences, symposia, meetings, and summits. To talk about the HIFU application in myoma uteri, the South African experience, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Raymond Setsen. Take it away, Prof. Good to see you, Dr. Raymond. Hey, all right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would, before I start, I'd just like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Raymond Setson from South Africa, and I'm going to be talking about the management of uh, fibroids, myomas, using HAFU. Just uh, as, when we look at the development of HAFU treatment over the, the, the last couple of decades, um, initially we started off with very invasive procedures where we would be performed laparotomies where either a hysterectomy or a myomectomy was performed. Um, and then with over the ages, as uh, we improved um, with laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, uterine artery embolization, uh, we developed these minimally invasive procedures, which did less harm to the, the patients. And now with um, imaging based procedure called HIFU, we've got a completely non-invasive procedure. HIFU has been around since 1999, and it's now practiced in 28 countries around the world uh, with more than 270 centers in China. So it's not something new. When we look at the, the principle of, of, of HIFU treatment, uh, what happens is we've got high intensity ultrasound waves, which are produced by a, a concave transducer, which is a ceramic piezoelectric transducer. And due to the, the nature of the, because it's concave in shape, all the ultrasound waves converge to a, a focal point, which is 12 centimeters from the transducer. And what happens at that focal point where all the ultrasound waves uh, converge, we get heat, thermal energy being produced at that focal point. And when that temperature reaches greater than about 56 degrees Celsius, it causes protein denaturation which will then land up with coagulation necrosis and cell death. It's very similar to using a magnifying glass to, to focus the sunlight. So what you can see over here is these are where the, the ultrasound waves are converging. There's minimal energy in this part over here, okay? But at that point there, 
is a lot of energy being produced. Sorry, it's a lot of energy being produced over here. So at this point here, if you put your finger there, you'll get burnt. If you put your finger anywhere along here, you won't get burnt. So what are the mechanisms of tissue damage with HIFU? So the, the first one, as we've mentioned, is conversion of the mechanical energy, which are the ultrasound waves, into thermal energy heat, which causes um, tissue death. The second way in which the, the HIFU works is a thing called inertial cavitation. Now, what happens is as the ultrasound wave is passing through the tissue, we get alternating cycles of compression and rarefaction or decompression. And it's during these rarefaction phases that we get gas bubbles drawn out of solution. And these bubbles fluctuate in size, getting bigger and smaller, and eventually getting bigger and bigger until they collapse, releasing energy. And this adds to the, to the temperature increase inside the fibroid. So this is what it basically, it looks like. Here you've got your ultrasound wave passing through the tissues. Here you've got your alternating compression and decompression phases. And you can see here what happens to the bubbles. They slowly increase in size, decrease, increase again until they get so big that they rupture. So this is basically what, what, what we're seeing. Here you've got your concave transducer. Here you've got your, what we call the acoustic pathway. This is where the ultrasound waves all come together and converge at the focal point. So we can go through, this is our coupling medium, which when we're treating, we're using water. Here you've got the skin, you've got the fat, you've got muscle. This is uterine wall here, and here you've got the fibroid. And what happens is the energy is deposited at that focal point. So there's minimal damage to these structures in between, between the transducer and the fibroid. So what happens basically with HIFU is that we selectively destroy tissue at depth without harming overlying tissues or adjacent structures within the path of the beam. So this is just to show you what uh, the skin looks like after our different uh, modes of treatment. This is a laparotomy, laparoscopy, and you can see here with half the skin is totally unblemished. That's what it looks like, the uterus itself looks like. So after whether you've done a myomectomy at a laparotomy or laparoscopically, you can see what the uterus looks like, whereas after half there's no marks on the uterus at all. So the scope of half it's not only used uh, in gynecology, it's used to treat banana malignant solid tumors, namely prostate, liver, breast, pancreatic cancers, bone cancers, renal cancers. And um, as my colleague before mentioned, benign gynecological conditions such as uterine fibroids, adenomyosis are the two main ones, uh, cesarean scar pregnancy, uh, placenta accreta spectrum disorders, and abdominal wall endometriomas. This is the machine that we use at my hospital. Um, HIFU, this is the company that uh, developed this technology and, and makes the machines, HIFU. And their logo is treatment should minimize harm to patients. And this is a machine we're using, it's a JC200. I'm not gonna go into details about the, the actual machine. I just wanna show you the, this, what we call the combined treatment head. This is the most important part of the machine. Here you can see we've got the, this is the concave transducer. And in the center of it, we have this B mode ultrasound probe. Um, so this is where we do the treatment and this is where we find the, the fibroids. So the treatment transducer is low frequency, high intensity, and in, therefore it's able to ablate tissues deep in the body. Whereas the imaging transducer the imaging transducer is uh, it's high frequency, low intensity, and therefore it doesn't create any damage to the tissues. Now, with our patient selection, we are treating symptomatic fibroids and adenomyosis. So it's patients arriving, the vast majority of our patients present with menorrhagia, a, a large percentage have anemia requiring blood transfusions, uh, dysmenorrhea, Infertility, poor obstetric history, obviously related to, to multifibroid uterus, not due to tubal occlusion. 
Um, patients with pressure symptoms, they present with very large uteruses and they have pressure symptoms, mainly constipation and urinary frequency. A lot of our patients want to preserve their uterus, whether they um, desiring fertility or not, they want to retain their uterus. Patients refuse surgery, they're scared of surgery, and a lot of our patients refuse any blood products. So it becomes very difficult to do surgery on these big multifibroid uteruses. Our criteria, um, the patient shouldn't be obese. Um, the abdominal wall thickness should be less than six centimeters in thickness. We go up to a uterine size of, of 18 weeks. We must be able to see the fibroid. So anything less than two, two centimeters, it's going to be difficult to visualize. So we won't do them. They should have a normal pap smear as with any other gynae procedure. Uh, there should be no intrauterine device or full eclipse, which could interfere with the uh, ultrasound waves, deflect the ultrasound waves. They shouldn't be pregnant or lactating. They should be of good general health. Um, again, there should be no big abdominal scars in, in, the, in the pathway, the, the acoustic pathway of the ultrasound beam, because this is going to land up causing skin burns. The patients must be able to lie prone for more than two hours without moving. This is important. Um, if they're claustrophobic or they're very anxious and, they, and they're fidgety, um, it's going to be a problem. Um, they need to be still for the duration of the treatment. And they must be able to communicate with the doctor because they need to tell us what symptoms they're feeling so that we can uh, adjust our treatment accordingly. Uh, exclusion criteria, as mentioned before, the, if they got a thick abdominal wall greater than six centimeters, if the uterine size is greater than 18 weeks, and if they've got big abdominal scars. So here you can see a patient who's obviously obese the, the abdominal wall thickness greater than six centimeters, but she got a terrible midline scar. This is going to cause burning of the skin, so she won't be done. And patients with multiple fibroids, we would rather refer them for myomectomy. So which fibroids? Obviously, all, all fibroids can't be treated. So um, what we do is we do MRI. Every patient who's coming for HIFU gets an MRI. And on the T2 weighted images, um, we look at the Fenarchy classification, which uh, classifies fibroids according to the signal intensity. Um, and the ones that we can't do are the type 3 fibroids, which, are, which we call hyper-intense. They've got a high signal intensity, which means that the, the fibroid is, is brighter in color than the surrounding myometrium. And this usually means that they, they, they're more vascular and the treatment outcome is going to be poor. So type 3 fibroids we, we, we won't treat. Also pedunculated fibroids are a problem, especially if they've got a thin stalk because they'll fall off into the pelvic cavity and uh, they won't shrink in size and they could be troublesome for the patient. Fibroids in the uterine cavity are also a problem because we, we try to preserve fertility here and there's a chance that we're going to damage the endometrial lining. So basically, just to quickly go through the half food procedure, I'm not going to go through in detail. You saw most of it on the video. The patient lies prone on the table. We, we place the patient in a position where the uterus is overlying the transducer. The patient is then administered uh, conscious sedation. Um, the fibroids are located using that B-mode probe situated in, inside the concave transducer. And once we find the fibroids, we direct the focal point into the fibroids, and then we start depositing energy into the fibroids. And we monitor the, the treatment by using grayscale change. And yes, just to show you what the grayscale change looks like, there you can see the focal point in the tissue. And as we're depositing energy, as we get coagulation necrosis, we start getting this white area, this hypochoic area, hypochoic area. And this is what we call grayscale change. And then we slowly move the focal point around inside the fibroid until we get probably about 80% of the fibroid um, becoming white in color. So how do we monitor our treatments? Obviously, we need to know when we've given enough treatment. As I've mentioned before, we do grayscale change. Um, the tissue becomes white once coagulation necrosis occurs. And here you can see the fibroid, how it's become white in color. <clears throat> we also use color Doppler. So we will put the color Doppler on before the treatment. 
um, look where the blood vessels are. Then when we think we've completed the treatment, we'll apply the color Doppler again and uh, make sure that there's no blood vessels inside the fibroid. And um, they also overseas, they're using micro bubbles where you've got tiny little nanospheres of contrast, which is injected before the treatment. And you can see the fibroid will, will light up where, with the contrast. And then you inject it again after the, the, you think you've completed the treatment and the fibroid then should not take up any of the contrast. Uh, we don't use it in South Africa. It's too expensive for us to use. Uh, there again is just some pictures to show you grayscale change. And if you, if you did half on a piece of ox liver, that's what the, the lesion would look like. Here again is just to show you the contrast ultrasound that I was talking about. So that's before half you can see the fibroid is bright in color. After treatment, there's no uptake of the contrast. So that fibroid has been ablated. So complications, now there's complications with, with any procedure. So with half as well, we do have complications. Um, the main one is pain, but this is usually transient and mild. It's short-lived, the, the pain. Um, remember, this is done under conscious sedation, so the patient is awake. It's not a general anesthetic. So during the procedure, they do feel pain. At the treatment site, inside the fibroid, it's normal because we're creating ischemia there. Pain in the, in the back and the buttocks, especially when you're treating uh, fibroids, posterior fibroids close to the spine, is also normal, but you need to be careful that you, you don't give too much energy there. Pain in the legs is, is a problem because if we continue um, giving energy to that area, there's a potential for nerve damage and the patient could get a foot drop. So the next one of importance is skin toxicity. Um, even though there's minimal energy inside the acoustic pathway, there is still energy there. And um, you can get an increase in the temperature of the skin, which can then give you blisters and burns. And again, being under conscious sedation, the patient will warn us that the skin is getting hot and then we'll take um, uh, precautions not to burn the skin. Um, obviously, bowel, bowel injury is a potential. Um, the problem with bowel is that it's got air inside it, air in stool. Even though they've had a bowel prep, um, there's still air in the bowel and bowel air is a problem for ultrasound waves. It's an enemy of ultrasound waves. It's going to deflect the, the ultrasound waves and it's going to cause damage to surrounding structures. So if bowel is in the way and we, 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 our, our ultrasound waves go through it, we can end up with uh, bowel injuries. We can also get bladder injuries if we're too close to the bladder. As I mentioned before, we can get endometrial damage with the Asherman syndrome um, and nerve injury. What are the advantages of HIFU over other procedures? It's a day procedure. The patient comes in, in the morning, she goes home after the procedure. It's completely non-invasive. So there's no, the uterine sparing is, is, is a major factor for us in South Africa. The patients don't want to lose their uterus. So if you're doing a hysterectomy or a myomectomy, if you're doing a myomectomy, sorry, uh, there is a chance that you, you may have to do a hysterectomy as a life-saving procedure because the patient is bleeding excessively. But here with HIFU, you don't have to worry about having to remove the uterus. And because it's such precise um, treatment to the target area, it doesn't affect the normal uterine tissue. So patients who become pregnant can deliver normally thereafter. Whereas after a myomectomy, they would need to have a cesarean section. There's no general anesthetic, so the recovery is much quicker. Uh, there's a foster recovery period. They return to work within days. Um, there's no ionizing radiation, so you can repeat this procedure as many times as you want. And uh, sometimes what we do, a patient has got, um, say, 15 fibroids. We can't treat them all at one sitting. So we'll treat five or so at one sitting, bring them back in three months' time, and then we can treat another five. And uh, as I say, you can do this procedure as often as you want. There's no problem with radiation. Also, there's no damage to the ovaries. Um, with this kind of procedure. It's also cost effective um, because the hospital stay, if they were coming in for a laparotomy, they would be in hospital for uh, five to seven days. And um, for a, for a, in South Africa, our medical system is under 
we, we, we've got a, a short supply of, of finances. So if we can get the patients discharged as soon as possible, um, it's important for us. Also, there's no blood transfusions required. And uh, in South Africa, blood is a very expensive and a rare commodity. Um, another problem with us is we have a, a heart, a heart HIV um, problem. So when you're doing these big uh, multifibroid uteruses, myomectomy, there is a chance that one of the doctors or sisters can get a needle stick injury. But again, with HIFU, there's no problem with um, transmission. Now, just quickly looking at the recovery times with the uh, ultrasound guided HIFU, it's one to two days, hysterectomy, the patients usually get booked off for four to six weeks, also with a myomectomy, and with the laparoscopic surgery, two to three weeks, and with uterine artery embolization, one to two weeks. Obviously, there's disadvantages and limitations, as with any procedure. Um, the acoustic pathway, as I mentioned earlier, cannot penetrate any structure that's got air in it, like lung or bowel. Um, it, depending on, this, on the position of the fibroid, so if it's a posterior fibroid and the patient's got a, a thick abdominal wall, we may not be able to reach it because we only have a focal length of 12 centimeters. And sometimes if the fibroid is surrounded by important structures, we may not be able to, to, to get a clear acoustic pathway. Um, unfortunately, the procedure is quite lengthy, um, dependent on the number and size of the fibroids. It's, uh, it, it takes a lot longer than a, than a myomectomy. Um, but then again, you've got to look at the recovery period thereafter. And small fibroids, two centimeters or less, um, if we can't see them on the ultrasound, we can't treat them. Whereas in a myomectomy, you'd probably be able to, to cherry pick them and get them out. So what are the factors affecting recurrence of, of fibroids? Um, the, if the maximum diameter is, is greater than six centimeters, there's a good chance that they can recur. Also, if, the, if there's increased vascularity, those type three uh, fibroids. Um, if your non-perfused volume after treatment is less than 60%, there's a very good chance that the fibroids can recur. And also with posterior wall fibroids, um, you get decreased energy into the fibroid that, that could could land up with a recurrence. When we look at the South African results, um, so I'm, I'm working at Chris Harney Baragwanath Academic Hospital, which according to the Guinness Book of Records is the third largest hospital in the world. Our hospital services a, a black population of 6 million people. Um, and with fibroids, as we know, three, to, three times more common in, in black females compared to any other race. So we have a very busy gynecology department um, where we see mo most of our patients are, are fibroids with associated complications. Um, our patient profile, it's uh, challenging in that the patients are, we have a, a high incidence of obesity. Um, by age 45, 80% of, of females are, are overweight or obese. We also, our patients are late presenters. Um, they, they first go to uh, traditional healers. Um, they have a fear of hospitals. They think they might be pregnant. So they present late. They present many years after the fibroids have, have developed. So they come in with multiple fibroids, very large fibroids, extreme symptoms. Um, also, with our, in our population group, um, you know, the usual age of fibroids is around about 35. We see patients as young as 18. And they also present with very extreme symptoms. And as I mentioned earlier, our HIV uh, rate is around about 24%. So that's a problem with surgery. And we have a very high incidence of infertility. And uh, as a result, most of these patients are going to refuse surgery because they're worried about landing up with the hysterectomy. This is just some pictures to show you cases of ours. This is sort of what we see with our a multi-fibroid uterus. There's a couple of pictures there. Uh, that's what the MRIs look like. Um, so they're challenging surgery as well as challenging half. So we've treated to date uh, 485 patients. They've all been black patients. The, the age varying from 18 up to 45. And you can see the, the weight between 43 up to 115 kilograms. 
um, with, with an abdominal wall thickness up to 64 millimeters. Now, most of the patients have, have had uh, multiple fibroids. Uh, the location, most of them being anterior, most are intramural. Um, and you can see that on the MRI, on the T2 signal intensity, um, lucky for us, most of them have been hypo intense, which are the, the good ones to treat. Um, patient symptoms, um, the vast majority, 73%, uh, present with dysmenorrhea and uh, amenorrhagia, uh, anemia in 68% of our patients, infertility 53%, uh, and then the bulk symptoms, constipation and, frequ and frequency of urination as well. Now, adverse events during the half food treatment that we've experienced, 78% um, present with lower abdominal pain, which we did mention earlier was sort of normal. Um, patients presenting with back pain or sciatic pain, 51%. Uh, burning sensation on the skin, 31%. And transient pain in the legs, 14%. In terms of major adverse events um, after the treatment, we've had of the 485 cases, we've only had two cases of first degree skin burns, which um, healed spontaneously within a couple of weeks. They didn't require any further treatment. We've had no bowel injuries, no bladder injuries. Uh, we've had two cases of nerve injury that also uh, resolved spontaneously within a couple of weeks. All our patients um, before treatment and, and after treatment at one month, three months, six months, 12 and 24 months, fill in a, um, a questionnaire where we look at the, the quality of life and the symptom severity. And as you can see here, uh, before treatment, um, the quality of life is, is quite poor. They have a score of about 35, which increases rapidly at one month and then increases slowly up to 24 months to they get, get a score of about 75. So there's a marked improvement in the quality of life of our patients after treatment. If we look at the symptom severity score, you can see before treatment, they start off with a high score of just below 60 and it drops down at 24 months to just below 20, so there's a marked improvement in, in symptom severity as well. Um, if we look at the shrinkage rate, at, at one month, on average, it's about 31%, going up to about 73% at 12 months. Uh, in terms of fertility successes, um, we've, we've had 16 cases. Eight patients are currently pregnant. We've had one four kilogram vaginal delivery and seven term cesarean deliveries, of which one was a twins delivery. Now, the problem with our, with our patients is that there's very uh, poor follow-up. Uh, the patients don't come back. Once they're pregnant, they don't come back. Uh, usually, we hear from our colleagues in private practice that they delivered one of our patients. So we only know of 16 cases. It could be a lot more. We're not sure. Here's uh, just some pictures of some of the cases that we've had. So now, when, when we're looking at... Um, the results of HAFU, uh, if we look over here, this patient uh, before treatment, um, two weeks after treatment, you can see uh, the non-perfused volume, um, it's probably about 80 to 90%. And uh, at four months, you can see how it's already shrunk quite significantly. And then at 10 months, the fibroid has, has, has shrunk dramatically. Uh, here's another one, before treatment, one month after treatment, um, and at 12 months, it's almost disappeared. Again, before treatment, one day after treatment, six months, 12 months. So you can see the, the gradual shrinking of the fibroid. So that's, a, that's another issue with HAFU. It's not a quick fix. It's not like a myomectomy where you've removed the fibroids and within a couple of weeks, the uterus is back to normal size. We've ablated the fibroid, we've, we've, we've just killed that fibroid, and slowly with time, it's going to, to shrink. So here you can see, here's one of our patients that we treated. This is before the treatment. Uh, this is one and a half months post-treatment. You can see the, the non-perfused volume. There's an ablation rate of about 98%, and already at one and a half months, a shrinkage rate of about 27%. Here's another case before HIFU. 
And then four months post HAFU, ablation rate of about 98%, shrinkage rate of about 63%. Another one where the ablation rate was about 71%, um, at th this one was at just at three weeks was uh, eight weeks, I mean, 8% shrinkage. He has another case with multiple fibroids, fibroid up there, fibroid here, fibroid here. Um, two days afterwards, you can see the non-perfused volume, we've got about 91% in the anterior fibroid, about 83%, 83% in the anterior fibroid, and in the, in the fundal one, which is up top here, um, you can see there's also quite a marked um, shrinkage rate. Uh, he has another case, a 41 year old patient, and you can see the non perfused volume. Now, here's a case that we, we wouldn't normally have done, but she's a young girl, 21 years old, and you can see she's got multiple fibroids inside the cavity. Now, normally we wouldn't have done that because we worried about destroying the, the endometrial, causing like an endometrial ablation. But she was adamant that she was going to have no form of surgery. And she presented with a severe menorrhagia and anemia, required a couple of transfusions. So we were, we were forced to do it. Um, this is what it looks like one month post-treatment. You can see that there's already, there's only a little bit left inside here. Uh, which we removed at the uh, uh, DNC. So there was quite a marked response for this patient. So in, in conclusion, I just want to finish off by saying that uh, HIFU is not, is not, we're not saying it's the answer to, to treating fibroids, but it definitely provides a safe and effective alternative in the management of symptomatic fibroids. So I thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Raymond, for making us understand the deeper concepts and therapeutic importance of HIFU in OBGYN. You made it simpler and easier to understand. I do appreciate the step-by-step -step, uh, working procedure, which you showed in your lecture, as well as the complications, which we need to watch out for. We do agree with that with the therapeutic application of HIFU comes some amount of precautions. This is something that struck me as a very holistic management of women wanting HIFU treatment, which is completely non-invasive. Kindly stand by Dr. Raymond for the open forum later. Thank you very much. Our next, next speaker is our very own Dr. Filomena S. San Juan the one who got a better foresight of the non-invasive high treatment movement in the Philippines. She is a young gynecologist awardee of the AOOPO and young researcher awardee of the AOOPO. Paul's Ramon Lopez and a season awardee. Outstanding alumni awardee in 2019 UP Medical Association and UPCM. NIH top 100 women of the 19th century in health science. She earned a degree of philosophy in medical science from graduate school division of medicine at Kobe University, Japan. A clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and established the UPGN ultrasound fellowship both in UPPJH. Former Chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Manila Doctors Hospital and Medical Center, Manila. A past president of the PSO, PSSTD, and PSCPTC. Currently, the president of the Philippines Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focus Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. SGOP. To talk about the comparison of high food and different modalities in the treatment outcome for adenomyosis yes. and myomyotary. Let us all welcome Dr. Philomena S. San Juan. Where is yours, Dr. Okay. No question. Share screen. Good afternoon. 
uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, those who stayed for the last lecture this afternoon. Uh, my topic is on comparison of HIFU and different modalities in the treatment outcome for adenomyosis and myoma uteri. I, as a disclaimer to this lecture, I do not receive any compensation in delivering this lecture. The contents of this lecture are my independent assessment of current scientific literature, my research and my personal observation and clinical experience. As we all gynecologists know that we have a lot of uterine myomatas. It has a prevalence of about 50 to 70% among women and adenomyosis ranging from five to 50% prevalence rate. Our aims of treatment are usually to relieve the patient of their discomfort from menorrhea, from uh, metorrhagia, hypermenorrhea, and restoration of function for them to be able to get pregnant, and of course, removal of the lesion. Throughout the years, as gynecologists, we have observed that the management of these tumors, benign tumors in gynecology started with open surgery based on anatomy and then open surgery based on modern biology. And then in the 1980s, we have the minimally invasive surgery based on laparoscopic technique. And now maybe the future is the extracorporeal non-invasive procedure based on imaging anatomy. Now, as we can see, there's a difference in the surface of the uterus after these three kinds of treatment. After a surgical myomectomy, you have an incision on the skin as well as incision on the uterus. A laparoscopic procedure may have only puncture holes on the skin, but still you have the same um, uh, problem of incision on the uterus. Whereas after an extracorporeal non-invasive surgery, the uterus is intact and you don't see any uh, incision on the surface. This also changes the scene when you do the treatment for these cases. In uh, open myomectomy or hysterectomy and laparoscopic procedure, you have to have your assistant doctors, you have to have the nurses, and you have to have the paramedical personnel in a very sterile environment. You have to prepare the patient for general or spinal anesthesia, as well as uh, prepare blood for any uh, bleeding intraoperatively. Now compare this with an extracorporeal virtual surgery for myoma uterine adenomyosis. You are in an outpatient room uh, setup. Instead of a standing surgeon, you have a sitting surgeon. Instead of holding a knife, the surgeon here is holding the mouse because uh, he is just in front of the uh, ultrasound machine and while observing, while he is treating the patient. And the patient is under conscious sedation. It is very important that the patient is not asleep or completely un anesthetized because the surgeon continually talks to the patient. And, and the anesthesiologist continually talks to the patient to find out if there is increased heat on the abdominal surface. Now, this is the disruptive machine. This is ultrasound guided, high intensity focus ultrasound. This is very ideal for obstetrician gynecologists because we don't deal with, uh, like in MRI guided uh, ultrasound, we don't, the only the radiologist can hold uh, these cases, but uh, with ultrasound guided uh, high intensity focus ultrasound, we all already have more than 3000 uh, specialists in uh, PISOG uh, who are trained to do ultrasound. And therefore it's just a matter of training more in order to do this therapeutic high intensity focus ultrasound. I was first introduced into this technology when I was invited in July, 2017 in the Yang, third Yangtze International Summit of Minimally Invasive and Non-Invasive Medicine. And I heard how these professors uh, reported their experiences on the use of this machine. 
and I was lucky enough to meet the father of the ultrasound guided high intensity focus ultrasound in the middle. He is Dr. Xiaobao Wang, uh, who started the use of this machine in the clinical setup. And uh, in that uh, workshop, uh, there were uh, doctors, interventional radiologists and gyne gynecologists uh, who were specializing in ultrasound, who were also attending the workshop, as well as the four Filipino uh, Filipinos from the Philippines, Dr. Rivera, Dr. Liamas, and Dr. Vitriolo Panilio. Now, I was amazed to see this young uh, obstetrician gynecologist. In fact, the man sitting uh, and doing uh, high intensity focus ultrasound treatment is a gynecologic oncologist. But I was amazed to see that he was not standing, he was not doing a radical hysterectomy or a radical ophorectomy, but rather he's uh, treating a patient using extracorporeal, extracorporeal high intensity focus ultrasound. Now, the basic uh, science behind this is that you apply you have a focus transducer emitting ultrasound waves uh, on a localized portion of the tumor. And once this uh, focal ultrasound waves reaches the tumor, it increases, it causes increase in temperature to as high as 85 degrees centigrade. And as the tumor leaves, as the mechanical uh, ultrasound wave progresses through the tissues, it causes increase and decrease of the pressure causing compression and rarefaction and gas is drawn out of the solution during rarefaction, creating bubbles. This can oscillate in size in a stable fashion with the changing tissue pressure, but ultimately collapse and cause local energy release and temperature will rise at the microscopic level. In the workshop that we attended, we were shown this simple liver tissue where they applied high intensity focus ultrasound. And within one to three seconds, you see the effect of the focus, high intensity focus ultrasound. This white area on the liver is uh, one millimeter in height and about three to five millimeter in diameter. This is the coagulation necrosis that occurs within one to three seconds after you fire off that uh, ultrasound. And on histologic, uh, on histology, you find that you see coagulation necrosis, uh, but it is very, uh, it is very specific and it is very localized because you have an undamaged tissue in front of the focus. Now, how did they, this uh, technology started in China? Now, in 1999, Dr. Shiba Wang, started to apply this ultrasound guided high intensity focus ultrasound in malignant tumors such as osteosarcoma. Instead of cutting the legs, they now just apply ultrasound guided HIFU and the osteosarcoma is arrested. Now, they also use this for metastatic liver cancer uh, so that together with chemotherapy, they can actually ablate the tumor in the liver. Now, Wong in 2002 gave his preliminary results on, on fibroid, and then Dr. Wu uh, reported his 85 patients in 2004. Since then, from 2006 to 2013, the government of China supported the company that produced the ultrasound guided high intensity focus ultrasound and distributed the machine in 10 centers in China so that from 2006 to 2013, there were 7,439 myoma uteris that were treated, of, including intramural, subserous, and submucous myoma. And included in this group are 2,549 adenomyosis cases. And of course, there were also acrita, placenta acrita, treated with HIFU, abdominal wall endometriosis, and ectopic pregnancy in the cesarean section scar. Now, when this machine was introduced in Europe and other parts of Latin um, America and uh, also in Southeast Asia in Asian countries, uh, they're, they're, the doctors who were very amazed at this uh, new procedure uh, could not find um, 
the results that the Chinese had in China because they were all reported uh, in Chinese journals. So this uh, group from Oxford who bought the machine and also Dr. Lang Jinghe, the president of the Chinese Medical Doctors Association joined together uh, to evaluate uh, the use, the effect, the, to evaluate the side effects and the use of high intensity focus ultrasound as an ablation procedure for uterine fibroids. This was a prospective exploration study uh, published in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. 20 centers were involved in this study. This was a non-randomized controlled prospective cohort study of treatment for fibroids. So China and the Natfields Department of Surgical Science in Oxford Hospital joined together and they used the uniform treatment protocol from March 2011 to 2013. Their eligibility criteria were the following. Those patients were premenopausal and have completed their family size and they have to confirm the diagnosis by ultrasound and also by MRI. And they only uh, include patients with symptomatic fibroid with any following indications for hysterectomy, such as uterus more than 10 weeks size, the presence of menorrhagia or secondary amenorrhea, the presence of uh, pelvic symptoms, uh, such as uh, pelvic pain, urinary frequency and constipation. Uh, if the patient has multiple fibroids, they only confine this to those with three fibroids and that the fibroids will have a diameter of at least two centimeters. And there must be, in case in patients who had previous surgery, the image blurring from the abdominal scar should be less than 10 millimeters in order to apply this technology safely. Now the exclusion criteria were the following. The presence of concomitant uterine adenomyosis were excluded, previous myomectomies, presence of concurrent pregnancy, the presence of pedunculated subserous or a submucosal fibroid, a single fibroid more than 10 centimeters, and the presence of concomitant PID or uncontrolled systemic disease, and when the patient cannot communicate adequately with the physicians. The outcome measures were the presence of complications or adverse reactions, the quality of life, and the percentage of re-interventions. So, there were 2,411 patients enrolled in this study. They were followed up at six months and 12 months. In the HIFU group, 1,353 patients were included there. In the surgery group, there were 1,058 patients. They were divided into the myomectomy group, 586, and the hysterectomy group, 472. They were followed up at 12 months in the HIFU group, despite the the fact that these patients were perimenopausal, uh, pregnancy occurred in 21 cases. And in the myomectomy group, uh, pregnancy occurred in three out of the 586 uh, cases who underwent myomectomy. Now with regards to uterine fibroid uh, symptoms, quality of life score or change in score, they're both HIFU and myomectomy had in, uh, improvement in their uh, decrease in their symptoms and improvement in their quality of life. However, there is slight difference. There is a statistic, statistically significant difference in the change of the, in the improvement and the quality of life in the HIFU group at six months and 12 months, but this was only very little. Over a long time in other studies, it showed that over three years or four years, they have all of, there is no significant difference as far as quality of life is concerned. Now, with regards to adverse reactions, this is a comparison of adverse reactions in 2,411 women with uterine fibroids allocated to treatment by high intensity focus ultrasound or surgery, either hysterectomy or myomectomy. So here in the minor adverse events, you can see that in the HIFU group, there were 1,353 patients and 335 or 
had minor adverse events. This was immediately after application, the patient would complain of slight hypogastric pain or slight back pain or sometimes numbness on the, on the legs. However, if you compare that with the surgery group of 1,058, there was a marked statistically uh, statistical difference of 68%. In the surgery group, they had minor adverse events of 68% compared to the 24% in the HIFU group. When the myomectomy group were considered, their minor adverse event also in, was high at 67% compared to 24% in the HIFU group. Now we go to um, uterine bleeding. Uh, as you can see with uterine bleeding, 6.5% in the HIFU group had uterine bleeding, but 21% in the surgery group had uterine bleeding and more in the myomectomy group at 25%. Now, um, with regards to major adverse events, there is very little in the HIFU group. Uh, there were 1,353 patients and only three patients had major adverse events. Uh, this is 0.2%. And these adverse events were usually secondary burns on the skin. This occurred during the early part of the study. However, in the surgery group, the adverse events is 12.6% compared to 0.2% in the HIFU group. So there were 133 um, major adverse events in the surgery group in the form of hemorrhage, infection, readmission, hematoma, thromboembolism. In the myomectomy group, the adverse events was 10.2% compared to 0.2% in the HIFU group. So the second degree burns, of course, only occurred in the HIFU group, but none in the surgery or myomectomy group. Now, this is the result in these 20 hospitals. So the number of patients, uh, almost equal, 1,353 with the HIFU, and you have also a total of 1,058 for the uh, surgical group, either patients underwent myomectomy or hysterectomy. And you see, it is very clear that there is statistical difference as far as minor adverse events are concerned. You have lower adverse events in the HIFU group compared to the surg surgery group. The major adverse events is also very low in the HIFU group compared to the myomectomy and hysterectomy group. Now with regards to hospital stay, uh, in the Chongqing uh, hospital, um, the procedure is outpatient. There is an outpatient HIFU procedure, but in the government hospitals in China, most of these patients have to stay longer because I, I don't know, they have some insurance with the government and, and I think it's uh, their um, culturally, uh, the patients would like to stay more in the hospital. So with the HIFU group, the average stay was 3.6 days, but in the myomectomy group, nine days, the hysterectomy group, 10 days. Now, with regards to return to work after the patient is discharged from the hospital, the patient goes back immediately to the office or go, uh, uh, goes back to his work as a housewife. But in the myomectomy group, the patient returns to work only after 24 days. The hysterectomy group after 29 days. Now, with regards to cost of treatment, uh, there is lower treat cost of treatment for the HIFU group, mainly because they stay only up for maximum of three days in the hospital. If they go to an outpatient uh, department where they have a high food there, they, uh, they are discharged on the same day. So the cost of treatment is lower, 1,953. This was in 2013. So 1,953 US dollars, but with a myomectomy, 2,146. Hysterectomy, 2,314 US dollars. So over time, over one to three years or four years, the quality of life is almost the same. There is improvement in the quality of life after intervention. Now, what about re-intervention or recurrence or retreatment of patients HIFU versus um, MRI-guided HIFU versus myomectomy? 
So if you look at the different authors and the years of treatment in the number of patients, J. Chen in 2017 reported this 1,333 patients who underwent ultrasound guided HIFU. At one year, there was only 1% recurrence or re-intervention rate. Compare that with Tomaso's report in 2019, where he treated 43 patients using MRI guided HIFU. So in the United States, they only have the MRI guided HIFU and the radiation oncologist in radiation, radiolo interventional radiologist is the one that does this. And they had a re-intervention rate of 12% in one year compared to 1% with ultrasound guided HIFU. The explanation here maybe is that with ultrasound guided HIFU, it, you actually see when you treat the patient, you see the changes on the ultrasound uh, when you treat the patient, therefore you see the boundaries you see how far are you from the serosal surface of the uterus, and, and you also see whether you have covered a majority of the uh, myoma uteri. So with uh, Tomaso's 2019-40 patients uh, using uterine artery embolization, because this is uh, quite also accepted in the United States as a treatment for myoma uteri, after three years, there was 13% re-intervention rate. Now, in Chen's report in 2017, there was the re-intervention with myomectomy was not available. So we could not, we do not know whether it was higher uh, versus ultrasound guided HIFU or lesser. But Liu in 2020 reported on 101 patients who underwent myomectomy and his uh, re-intervention rate was lower 4.8 percent compared to MRI guided HIFU. Now at two years, still the re-intervention with ultrasound guided HIFU is only 2.4 percent compared to 12.7 percent in any more any re-intervention, but Liu in his 101 patients reported re-intervention rate of 3.2 percent. But compare that with MRI guided HIFU, it was 30%. That is why in that study, they stopped the study after three years. So Liu, in his 101 patients who underwent myomectomy, there is significantly more re-intervention rate at three years of 11.9% compared to 3.2% in patients who uh, receive ultrasound guided HIFU. So in conclusion in that study, in the treatment of fibroids, adverse effects are infrequent in HIFU. The hospital stay and return to work is shorter. Ultrasound guided HIFU has lower cost of the procedure. The re-intervention rate in HIFU is small, 1% in the first year and only 3% on the third year. HIFU therefore is safe, effective, cost effective and affords speedy recovery. Now let's look at the study on the long-term clinical outcomes of ultrasound guided HIFU ablation for symptomatic submucosal fibroids. This was a retrospective comparison with uterus sparing surgery. So there were 245 patients who underwent ultrasound guided HIFU and 129 patients who underwent uterine sparing surgery. With uterine sparing surgery, they were subdivided into open myomectomy in 49 patients, laparoscopic myomectomy in 74 patients, and hysteroscopic myomectomy in six patients. The patients were followed up over a long time from 89 months on average uh, from 40 to 140 months. And they also evaluated the quality of life using the quality of life questionnaire. Now, as far as distribution of patients under HIFU and under um, uterine sparing surgery, there was no significant difference as far as the age, the tumor diameter, and the types of fibroids, and the baseline signs and symptoms. Now, the symptom relief and recurrence of symptoms at one to four years of symptomatic submucosal fibroid, when they compared ultrasound HIFU versus uterine sparing, there was a, a significant, statistically significant 
uh, symptom relief, 95% in the ultrasound guided HIFU and 89% in the uterine sparing surgery. This was statistically significant of less than 0.05. Now with regards to recurrence of symptoms in that study where they only dealt with submucosal submuc fibroids, at one year in the ultrasound guided HIFU, the recurrence is 1.7% compared to 6.5% in those who underwent uh, myomectomy, whether open myomectomy, laparoscopic or hysteroscopic myomectomy. At two years, ultrasound guided HIFO also has lesser recurrence at 6.8% compared to 12.29% in the laparoscopic myomectomy or open myomectomy and a hysteroscopic myomectomy. And even at four years, the recurrence rate in ultrasound guided HIFO is 11.9%. But however, it is very high in the ut uterine sparing surgery at 27.1%. Now, what about complication rate? Severe complication rate, there was zero in the ultrasound guided HIFU and you, in the uterine sparing surgery, there was a 3.1% complication rate. Now, this is just a sagittal MRI of a 34-year-old woman receiving ultrasound guided HIFU ablation of a type two symptomatic submucosal fibroids. So letter A, the first picture on your left, uh, you see on, on T2 image, you see this um, uh, tumor in the uterine cavity, a submucosal type two uh, tumor uh, fibroid with T1 contrast enhanced uh, MRI. You see the perfusion of this uh, at letter B, that you see the tumor perfused with a, uh, with a contrast material. And when this patient underwent high intensity focus ultrasound, a day after, you can see that when they used the T1 uh, contrast enhanced MRI image, the contrast material is not absorbed by the myoma because the, the, all the tissues there already underwent coagulation necrosis. There's no more blood supply in that area. So it appears black compared to preoperatively that the myoma should appear white when there is uh, absorption of the contrast material. Now, after six months, you see a significantly decreasing uh, size of the submucous myoma. And after one year, you have here a beautiful normal size uterus with an intact endometrial lining with no evidence of submucous myoma. Now, how about the cumulative symptoms recurrence rate after uterine sparing surgery versus ultrasound guided HIFU using the kaplan mayer curve? You can see that there is a significant difference in the recurrence rate of, of, the, of the symptoms. In the green, uh, on the green uh, graph would represent the, those who underwent uh, myomectomy and the blue graph would represent those who underwent high intensity focus ultrasound. So there were more uh, recurrence of symptoms after two, three or four years when uh, patients underwent uh, surgery, myomectomy for uh, submucous myoma. So in conclusion in that study, long-term clinical outcome, ultrasound guided HIFU may be better than uterine sparing surgery and ultrasound guided HIFU may be safer than sparing surgery. Now, this will just show you uh, expulsion of the submucous myoma. You have here on uh, T2 image and MRI, you have a well-defined myoma there. And then after uh, treatment, subsequently this myoma would uh, be seen at the lower uterine segment. And then eventually after a few days, that myoma was already in the vagina. And when you do your speculum exam, you see the myoma in the vaginal canal. This was a submucous myoma, maybe with a small. Was, uh, uh, appeared in the vagina. So when they did an MRI, they don't anymore see any myoma in the uterine cavity. Again,
white lesion there before HIFU. After application of HIFU, there is coagulation necrosis, so that when you do again your contrast enhanced image on MRI, you don't see any more the contrast material in the myoma. This becomes smaller over after maybe after three months, then after six months, and after one year, you have a very normal uterus there with no mm -hmm. submucous myoma inside. So what about pregnancy and childbirth? What is the difference between those who underwent HIFU and those who underwent um, myomectomy, uh, whether laparoscopic or open surgery or uh, transvaginal uh, or hysteroscopic myomectomy? So this is a, jour a journal, a comparison of the pregnancy outcomes between ultrasound guided HIFU ablation and laparoscopic myomectomy for uterine fibroids. This was a comparative study of 676 women with symptomatic fibroids who wished to be pregnant in three hospitals from 2009 to 2018. And with regards to pregnancy rate, you will see that in the median follow-up of five years with a range of one to eight years, 68.4% in the ultrasound guided high foo uh, patients who wants to be, get pregnant got pregnant, and as well as those who underwent laparoscopic myomectomy. However, there is a difference, statistical difference, as far as time of pregnancy. Those who underwent ultrasound guided high foo had earlier pregnancy, as even reported cases, even as early as three months after a uh, high foo. But here, the average was 13.6 months for the ultrasound guided HIFU for the patient to get pregnant. And for the laparoscopic myomectomy, it took a longer time of 18.9 months for the patient to get pregnant. So the, as far as cesarean section rate, there were less cesarean section rates, 41.6% in the ultrasound guided HIFU compared to a high 54.9% for those who underwent laparoscopic myomectomy. And this was statistically significant p-value of less than 0.05. Now, with regards to delivery outcomes of those patients of the 351 pregnancies after ultrasound guided or laparoscopic myomectomy in percentages, uh, the, in the delivery approaches, there was a significant uh, p-value because most of those patients who underwent ultrasound guided high foo had spontaneously had spontaneous vaginal delivery at 51% compared to the, the laparoscopic myomectomy group only had spontaneous vaginal delivery in 36.4% of patients who got pregnant. The cesarean section rate, the forceps delivery was almost the same, not significant difference. But with regards to cesarean section rate in the ultrasound guided IFU, it was only 41.6%. But in the laparoscopic myomectomy group, it was higher at 54.9%. With regards to whether the patients delivered at term or prematurely, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Now, what about complications? So as you can see in, in the, what about complications regarding hypertensive disorders, gestational diabetes, fetal distress, fetal growth restriction, large infants, placental abruption, placental abruption there is no significant difference between the two. However, please take note that in the, the presence of placenta in Krita, and placenta previa was higher, significantly higher in the patients who underwent laparoscopic myomectomy. So compare that, the presence of placenta in Krita was only 1.1% in the ultrasound guided HIFU, but it was 6.4% uh, in those who had laparoscopic myomectomy. The presence, the incidence of placenta previa was 2.8% in the HIFU group but 8.7% in those who underwent laparoscopic myomectomy. And this was statistically significant. With regards to uterine rupture, 0.6% occurred in the high food group and also 0.6% in the, 
in the laparoscopic myomectomy group. So there was no significant difference. Amniotic fluid in the uh, embolism, postpartum infection, and postpartum hemorrhage, there was no significant difference between the two groups. In conclusion, ultrasound guided HIFU shortens time to pregnancy. Pregnancy ratio between the ultrasound guided HIFU and laparoscopic myomectomy are similar. The cesarean section rates are higher in laparoscopic myomectomy, and this was statistically significant. Placenta previa and placenta increta is higher in the laparoscopic myomectomy group, and this was statistically significant. Uterine rupture was almost the same between the two groups. Now, this was a, a study comparing the reproductive outcomes of patients with adenomyosis and infertility treated with high intensity focus ultrasound and laparoscopic excision. So these are the patients who were infertile and they were uh, known to have adenomyosis. So on the patient's baseline characteristics, there was no difference as far as the variables of age, BMI, dysmenorrhea pain score, menorrhagia, uh, hemoglobin level, uterine volume, and length of infertility. So almost the same. Uh, there was no statistically dif uh, different, statistical difference in the variables. Now, with regards to comparison of dysmenorrhea severity pain scores uh, in a follow-up of this patient, uh, the decrease in the dysmenorrhea occurred in both groups, and there was no statistical difference even at one month, six months, or 12 months. The, regarding comparison of menorrhagia severity scores between these patients who underwent HIFU and laparoscopic excision, not myomectomy, laparoscopic excision of the adenomyosis, uh, of, there was no the statistical difference in the decrease in the menorrhagia at one, six, and 12 months between the two groups. However, with regards to pregnancy outcome, we can see a difference between those who underwent HIFU, HIFU and those who underwent laparoscopic excision of the adenomyosis. So pregnancy rate was higher in the HIFU group. Uh, there were 50 patients who got pregnant. So 26 out of 50 patients got pregnant in the HIFU group. In the laparoscopic excision of the adenomyosis, there were 13 out of 43 or 30% only got pregnant. So this was statistically significant. With uh, regards to pregnancy, more patients in the HIFU group spontaneously got pregnant in a natural way. So no intervention from the gynecologist. So 40% got pregnant, 20 out 50 uh, got pregnant without any intervention or additional uh, hyperstimulation or intrauterine insemination. And, but with uh, compared to the laparoscopic excision group, only 18.6% of these patients or eight out of 43 uh, spontaneously got pregnant. Um, those, there were more, with regards to the assisted, uh, assisted patients to get pregnant, uh, there was no significant difference. Regards to pregnancy outcome, delivery rate, also there was no significant difference. Uh, the, those who had miscarriage, there was no significant difference between the HIFU and laparoscopic excision group. And the cesarean section, uh, there was also no significant difference, vaginal delivery, no significant difference, and the complication rate also has no significant difference between HIFU and laparoscopic excision of adenomyosis. Now, this is just, uh, you saw a lot of this picture with Dr. Eilis uh, lecture this, uh, this evening. So you have here an enlarged, globularly enlarged uterus on a T2 image of MRI, and you have an enlarged posterior myometrium, and then when contrast enhanced with T1 image, you see the uptake, the hyper resonance here, a white echo on the adenomyosis in the posterior wall of the uterus. After treatment with high FU, there is no more in, uh, uptake of the contrast material. So you see a black uh, uh, image there 
because of the coagulation necrosis afforded by the high foot treatment. So in summary, I have presented to you a prospective multicenter study using ultrasound guided HIFU or laparoscopic myomectomy or hysterectomy, comparing the outcome measures of complications, quality of life, and reintervention. I also presented to you a study on the comparative study on pregnancy outcomes between ultrasound guided HIFU and laparoscopic myomectomy, and a study on the comparison of reproductive outcomes of patients with adenomyosis and infertility treated with ultrasound guided HIFU or laparoscopic excision of adenomyosis. And the results showed that in the treatment of fibroids, ultrasound guided HIFU is non-invasive, safe and effective modality of treatment. It is cost effective and affords speedy recovery of patients. It shortens time to pregnancy and decreases cesarean section rates. Ultrasound guided HIFU results in significant reduction of placenta previa and placenta increta compared to laparoscopic myomectomy intervention. In adenomyosis, ultrasound guided HIFU results to statistically more pregnancies and more spontaneous conceptions compared to a laparoscopic excision of adenomyosis. So in conclusion, I would say that ultrasound guided HIFU is a safe and effective modality of treatment that ultrasound guided HIFU is the future. It is non-surgical. It is non-invasive treatment of myoma uteri and adenomyosis in gynecology. So these are just the pictures showing you uh, the four Filipinos who went there in the first, in the, in the workshop in 2017, together with uh, the interventional radiologists and gynecologic oncologists in Egypt and Southeast Asia. Then the second time, we went for another workshop. Uh, very thankful to Dr. Raymond uh, Setsen, who was very uh, accommodating in the third largest hospital in the world in Chris, Christian uh, Hanna, Hanna Hospital in Johnsburg. So you can see here that uh, they are demonstrating and we also uh, were able uh, to have our hands uh, hands-on training on the use of HIFU for uh, adenomyo uh, for myoma uteri. The, they have very large myoma uteris there. And this is the uh, HIFU transducer in the middle. And uh, Dr. Uh, Setsen uh, teaching us uh, how to use the uh, HIFU machine. And uh, this is the Chris Hani Baraguana Hospital very large hospital, more, I think it's more than 3,000 beds. And uh, after our training there, we were brought to the safari and we had time to uh, inter, you know, uh, see the, uh, the animals there. And we went to the Villacasi Street, which was the really the area that caused the start of the independence of South Africa. And we were very happy to visit the house of Nelson Mandela. And here you see the wife, beautiful wife of Nelson Mandela. So after this lecture, I would like to invite you to be a high food doctor and in order that we minimize harm to our patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. San Juan for that enlightening comparison of the different treatment modalities as well as the treatment outcome for adenomyosis and myoma uteri. I must agree that HIFU is an excellent non-invasive therapeutic ablation technique for deeply seated targets in the body. We appreciate the different studies which you presented making HIFU treatment to be generally safe, clinically effective, and with high clinical acceptance. Thank you, Dr. So before we go to the open forum, let us all watch the Argentinian experience on HIFU treatment Kindly take it away, Russell, for the high full video. Thank you. Do you think it is possible to treat tumors without having to undergo surgery? Without suffering? In China, a non-invasive therapy has been created, which treats solid tumors and it's revolutionizing world medicine for its many qualities. 
It preserves the integrity of the patient. It is faster because each procedure takes approximately 30 minutes and it's ambulatory. And it provides precision. That is how Haifu was born. Let us look into the details. The equipment generates a big amount of energy which raises temperature and through ultrasound waves it focuses directly on damaged tissues, causing them to go into coagulative necrosis. That means it extinguishes them without harming its surroundings. It has been used in countries such as Germany, Great Britain, Russia, Spain, Italy, Cuba and Japan, among others. Haifu arrives in Argentina in 2017, and it's the 18th place in the world and the first in Latin America. José Cepaz is one of the largest and most densely populated cities in the Gran Buenos Aires area. Its mayor, Mario Ishi, has built a public oncology hospital free of charge for everyone and with a surface of 570 square meters where this equipment was installed, making it avant-garde. We are the HIFO Center in José Cepaz has brought big improvement to the local community and to patients who come seeking attention and treatment from other cities or even neighboring countries. Se dio la oportunidad con el equipo y probé. No vas a ver un procedimiento quirúrgico donde te van a cortar, donde te van a coser ni nada. Y los resultados se ven con los estudios. Haifa technology is used to treat different gynecological pathologies with great results, giving hope to many women of becoming mothers. Es mucho mejor que una cirugía y que te invadan de otra manera y que corras el peligro de quedar estéril. Yo eh, me arriesgué a esto porque justamente quiero tener el día de mañana una familia. According to the prognosis, in only three months after the procedure, women can plan a pregnancy if they so wish. The Haifu Center at the Public Oncology Hospital of José Cepaz is proud to have welcomed Giovanni, the first Haifu baby in Latin America. Habíamos perdido ya las esperanzas de tener un bebé después de tanto tiempo. Era algo totalmente inalcanzable, era imposible. Y se dio, se dio gracias a la tecnología, a mí me dio, me devolvió la salud y me devolvió la alegría. Yo había perdido las esperanzas. Hoy tengo a mi bebé y la felicidad es doble. So far, around 200 procedures took place here in excellent benefits for the patients. Haifu in José Cepaz is setting a precedent. Este equipo está conectado con Chile, la central de Haifu. Y cualquier problema que podamos tener nosotros, la conexión con China para que desde China lo pueden operar también. Since its opening to this day, it has become a center of reference and training for Latin America. Haifu is the hope for those who come here overwhelmed by a scary prognosis. Este hospital es para José de Paz, para toda Latinoamérica, porque no se cobra un peso, es gratuito, porque no se puede medir la vida. Thank you, Chongqing Medical um, Company, for the videos. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, may we now come to the open forum. May I invite all the speakers and kindly put them on a spotlight, please. Thank you, Russell.
to set the open forum, this is a very relevant question in time of this uh, pandemic. Do you feel that the ultrasound HIFU treatment is an appropriate technology for myoma uteri and adenomyosis in this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, we start the uh, uh, asking Dr. Eilie. Professor Eilie, would you like to answer this? Professor Eilie? Oh, we start with Dr. Setson. Professor, could you comment? Yeah, on look, in, in, at our hospital, um, we, during the, the COVID, when there was a lockdown, all elective surgery was canceled. So anything like a myomectomy or hysterectomy for, for multifibroid uterus was canceled. But because we could do HIFU as an outpatient procedure, we, we continued with it. So um, for us, it was, it was a, a great advantage. We managed to continue treating our patients. So we, we were very happy about that. Yeah, okay. So Dr. San Juan, would you like to comment? Just a question. Is high food treatment an appropriate technology for myoma uteri and adenomyosis in this time of COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I would say that patients now don't want to stay in the hospital for a longer time. So HIFU can be done on an outpatient basis, or at most in China, they stayed only for three days. Uh, at the same time, patients uh, don't want to uh, be placed in the operating room. It's more expensive to be put in the operating room. And uh, even the companions in the Philippines have to have a uh, RT-PCR test for them to uh, accompany the patients in the rooms. So since HIFU is very fast and uh, patients can be discharged as soon as possible and the patients can go back to their work as uh, soon as possible, I, I would say that HIFU would be a better treatment because the patient would not have to undergo blood transfusion. They don't have to be given intravenous prophylactic antibiotics prior to treatment. There's no incision. The downtime is very low they can actually get, get out of their house on the following day and go to their work. So I think it, it, HIFU now is really relevant in these times when patients don't want to stay in the hospital for long. Thank you, Dr. So there are a lot of... Uh... Thank you, Dr. There are a lot of questions about the Philippines um, is HIFU available here in the Philippines? That is one question. I think Dr. San Juan, you may answer this as well as the how much is HIFU procedure in the Philippines? Is HIFU going to be available? These are prominent questions in the chat box. And also, would you like to answer this, ma'am? Um, in the Philippines, uh, there is no... Uh, the uh, one hospital uh, wanted to buy this last year, but because of the pandemic, because of the decrease in the admission of the hospital and the change in the priority of the hospital, uh, this was uh, uh, postponed for next year. But I believe that in the next three years, uh, there will be other hospitals will be buying this machine. How I wish we have it now, because this will be more re relevant in times of pandemic. Uh, with regards to the treatment, uh, for the cost of treatment. In 2013, HIFU cost about 100,000 pesos, that's uh, 1,900 US dollars. Now, maybe right now it would cost the patient lesser than when the patient is admitted for hysterectomy. Because uh, when a patient is admitted in a private room, in a tertiary hospital, maybe the patient would uh, pay about 200,000. And maybe with HIFU, maybe less than that. Um, the other question is, uh, is there, the other question is, is there a requirement for one to be a virtual HIFU surgeon in obstetrics and gynecology? Definitely, definitely, because you will be uh, delivering uh, a high, uh, high intensity focus ultrasound on a specific tumor. Now you have to know one has, to very, one has to have 
a very good background on ultrasonography, pelvic ultrasound and abdominal ultrasound before one can apply HIFU as a therapeutic modality. Because when there are intestinal loops on the anterior surface of the uterus or the fundal area of the uterus, you're not able to uh, see this on ultrasound and you do, and you do not, uh, you're not able to angulate the source of your high intensity focus ultrasound, there's possibility that you are going to uh, burn these intestines or the bladder or, or the adherent rectosigmoid. And you have to know the different uh, types of myoma uteri, which one would uh, be better treated with HIFU and which one are not. And that you should be able also to identify uh, cancer cases sarcomas rather than ordinary myomas, because there's a different treatment for sarcoma. In gynecologic oncology, we do uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, treatment for this. Uh, and also we have to identify uh, whether there are metastases from sarcoma. So uh, it needs a good sonographer to be able to use this machine uh, properly and safely for patients. Thank you, Doctor. Another question is how much is the machine? Would you like to answer this one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, before you answer that, Doctor, I would like to acknowledge Professor Ising C. Eiley. I see you in the uh, chat box now. Professor Eiley, good evening. Hello, terribly sorry. Internet in our here, a little bit naughty. All of yeah. disappear. I'm terribly sorry. Very it's nice okay. to see uh, the beautiful two ladies and uh, also the Professor Freeman, very famous high school doctor. Good to see uh, you, I Professor. Want, yeah, I want to see my warm love to all the doctors in the internet. That is a really very hard time. But yeah. I feel the coronavirus cannot destroy our soul and our spirit. I'm just Thank curious. You so much. I am just curious, Professor, do you do a lot of high food treatment during this pandemic in Shanghai, China? We insist on to help patients try our best. So you keep on doing the high food treatment yes. in Shanghai, yes. Yes. even with the pandemic? Yes, yes. Yeah. Because it, uh, it was safe. Will not have, a, like uh, today, San Juan, the, the beautiful lady, she gave us a very specific and a comprehensive introduction. So we, when we do the hypo surgery, there are no incision, there are no blood. So we will not contact with patient directly. So we have distance, very safe. Yes, thank you, Professor. So going back to the question, how much is the hypo machine? Uh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm working in public hospital in Shanghai, so it's not my business. I am a pure doctor. My mission is to help patients. Uh, the business belongs to the director of the hospital. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. So, Dr. Sanwan, is this a... Uh... It, is, um, it is affordable by our tertiary hospitals, actually. Once they realize that patients would really love to have this machine not to be operated on, not to be incised, but uh, be uh, given high food treatment and be able to be discharged uh, as soon as possible from the hospital. Nobody loves to go to a hospital right now, but uh, you can have high food in an outpatient basis. Now, the first high food, the local company uh, is offering for the first hospital is gonna buy it is offering 120 million pesos for the HIFU machine. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Le. So I have seen in the chat box a question coming from a very prominent infertility expert in the Philippines, Dr. Aileen Manalo. And she asked about the resistant cases and pregnancy rate among infertile patients and any sarcoma missed. So Professor Eiley, I believe you answered this in the chat box with 2% resistant cases and the pregnancy rate after the, an infertile patient underwent uh, high food treatment is 67 and you never missed any sarcoma. Now I am curious, 
Professor Setsen, in Johannesburg, do you have any issues with sarcoma being missed as well as the resistant cases, the pregnancy rate after an infertile patient underwent high food treatment? Could you probably give out your statistics in South Africa, please? Yeah, so <clears throat> of all the almost 500 patients that we've treated, we haven't had a case of sarcoma yet. Um, when we have uh, difficult MRIs to assess, we, we normally have an MDT meeting with the radiologists um, and we review the MRIs. Um, so yeah, fortunately to date, we, we haven't had any um, sarcomas that we've treated thinking that they were fibroids. Yes, definitely right. So up to now, we finished nearly 2,000 cases. We never missed uh, sarcoma. So very strict uh, selection before performing high food. So I agree with the Dr. Riemann. Good to know, yeah. Professor Setsen and Professor Aili. Another question for Professor Setsen. What is the largest myoma uterine you have treated in your hospital? And did it necessitate a re-intervention with repeat HIFU application? So the, the bigger the fibroid, obviously the bigger the fibroid, the, the bigger the chance of um, failed treatment. The biggest success that we've had was a 16 week size fibroid, one single fibroid. Um, the treatment took us about two and a half hours and um, we got a very good result from that. But yeah, obviously the bigger the fibroid and also when we've got multiple fibroids, um, there is a chance that uh, there's going to be a higher re-intervention rate. Uh, the other thing that's, that is also quite difficult to establish is whether these are, are fibroids that have recurred or whether they're new fibroids that have developed. Because when you look at the MRI, you can see tiny small seedings uh, that are already there. So when you see the patient two, three years later and they've got um, new fibroids there, we don't know if, they, if they're new fibroids or fibroids that we've treated previously. So it's quite difficult to tell, but the biggest one we've treated successfully was a, a 16 week size fibroid with a single treatment. A single treatment for a 16 weeks fibroid. That it is. took us about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> So is there a way to prepare a patient with large myomas prior to HIFU? How does it affect treatment? So what we do with the, the very big fibroids and the ones that look particularly vascular, um, you see, we, we, we treat a lot of fibroids in South Africa that other countries probably wouldn't treat because our patients refuse any form of treatment, any kind of surgical treatment. So we are basically forced to treat them. So those patients with the very big fibroids, the ones that look on the bit on the vascular side, we put them onto GnRH uh, analogs for three months beforehand um, before we start treating them. Yes, yeah. so I must we, say, yeah, we do the shrink. same. The very important yeah. thing is to uh, shrink the size of the uterus. We have many muscles, so GnRH is a good choice. Can reduce the vessel. So After you smaller than do the high food, it will be easier. So it's not necessary to take challenge to perform okay. the huge one. It's very dangerous. The mm -hmm. biggest one we done in Shanghai is the nearly 16 weeks. The top of the uterus, the founders, equal to the umbilicus. So, but the patients happened. Uh, some problem after surgery, so I would not uh, <laughs> choose this kind of very big size myoma later. So, Professor Setsen, when we deal with the 16 week um, myoma uterine, you do GnRH first, and after that, you wait for how many months before you go on with the treatment? No, so when, once the treatment has stopped, we do it within a month. So we give the three, three months of GnRH analogs first, and then uh, we wait about a month, and then we, we do the treatment. So as I say, it's not ideal. I, uh, we wouldn't normally do this, but we have no alternative. These patients are 
have got severe symptoms. They're requiring, a lot of them have had two or three transfusions. They absolutely refuse any kind of surgery, myomectomy or anything. So we basically do those under those conditions. Uh, not out of choice. <laughs> we'll not recommend the big one. Yeah. So no, we don't recommend it, but we, we, we forced to do it. Uh, yeah. You are the king of the multiple big myoma in the world. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that means. Yeah, you're very good. You are doing very well. But the cases we done in Shanghai, we focus on adenomyosis. So my research direction focus on endometriosis disease. So we have many adenomyosis. They wouldn't like perform hysterectomy. As we know, adenomyosis, the final choice, uh, mostly to perform hysterectomy. But we have many very young ladies, they wouldn't like lose their uterus. So the final choice will be uterus or menstruation. So we call adenomyosis like vampire. It's depending on estrogen. It's depending on menstruation. So we found many ways to stop menstruation. Then the first thing we do, haifu. Second, we will give GnRH or other medicine to let the uterus have a very good rest for three months. Then after 18 days, we will have a very beautiful small size of uterus. Then we will perform third step. Third step, so two years ago, we usually do hyster diagnostic hysteroscopy and put the marina. But we found that marina usually cannot stop the growing of the adenomyosis. So last year in the very severe coronavirus situation, the patient from Wuhan, she can't come to, she did, cannot come to Shanghai, but she accepted ablation of my endometrium in local hospital. That is a very good, very smart procedure. So uh, the patient is only 40 years, and they will, she will not have menstruation, and uh, she relieve all, no anything. No menstruation, no pain, and then she had a free. So now we change the strategy. We, the third step, we will do resection of endometrium to destroy the old endometrium. But after the small size of the uterus, we call uh, 633, like the size of the uterus smaller than six centimeter. And the level of CA125 less than 35 is our the, the standard limitation. And the estrogen less than 30, 39 PG, that we call 633, uh, style and the patient can easily understand. The first we destroy the upside of enemy, like in the uterine wall, and the second step we stop the menstruation. The third step we destroy the endometrium, the root of this disease. So we have hmm. three step procedure to kill the endomyosis. Yeah. The patient was happy. Now, in South Africa, we don't see much in the way of uh, adenomyosis or endometriosis, but yeah, we have. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So you are the king. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Professor Eile, Professor Setse. We are IT challenge. I got lost for a while. So thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we have to close this webinar. And I would like to thank all the three distinguished speakers for a very engaging, free and open-minded presentation and discussion. Of course, all the audience for listening and for your active participation. We learned a lot indeed. Thank you so much, Professor. And kindly fill up the evaluation form posted in the chat box or flash your cameras on the QR code, which you are seeing right now, and it will direct you to the evaluation form. For now, we shall have the Biofam AVP before the closing remarks by our Vice President. Um, take it away, Russell.
Thank you so much. Very excellent. Thank you so much. Thank we so much. are BioFam. We are the leader in women's health care. We've taken the latest breakthroughs to offer you this revolution in progesterone. This is Herogest. It is micronized, reduced to micrometer particles. Herogest can easily be absorbed by the body. It is natural, sourced from nature. It's identical to the progesterone in the human body. It is revolutionary. It's natural progesterone. It's just what your patients ordered. A revolution in progesterone. Herogest. Micronized. Natural. Available now from BioFam. It's Sarah Hu, SNS and Technomed Philippines for making this webinar possible. This is definitely not the last. In fact, this shall be the first of our webinar series for HIFU. Hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for everyone concerned. And for our closing remarks, may I welcome our dear Regina Rosario Panlilio Vitriolo, the Vice President of the Philippine Society for Therapeutic High Intensity Focused Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Over to you, Dr. Panlilio. Thank you, Malu. Good evening to everyone. Uh, before we finally close this very interesting webinar, on behalf of the Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focus Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology, let me express my gratitude to our awesome speakers, Professor Aising Zi Aili from China, Professor Raymond Set Sen of South Africa, and of course, our very own Professor Philomena San Juan. It's so good to see all of you again, even just through this virtual screen. We deeply appreciate the knowledge, the expertise, experiences, updates, and almost magical treatment responses you have shared with us today with the HIFU technology. Definitely, there is so much promise from HIFU for affected women with adenomyosis and myoma, particularly during this pandemic when we try to avoid open surgery. Being a non-invasive and precise technology with the benefit of rapid recovery, it is one ideal non-surgical therapeutic option for these gynecologic diseases we all look forward to having. Today's webinar, hopefully, is just the start of a series of sharing of experiences of users of ultrasound-guided HIFU from all over the world where HIFU has long been in use till we can eventually have our local experiences to share. Through this Webinars, we are optimistic, as Professor Someone have said, that ultrasound-guided high-intensity focus ultrasound would finally gain recognition locally and be available in our country soon. Thank you once again to our esteemed speakers, as well as to our audience. Our gratitude also goes to our industry partners for the unwavering support. Good night and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Panlilio. Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Good night and keep safe. I would like to invite the panelists for a group picture, please. Professor Setsen and Professor Eilie, are you still there? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, can we have a, a group picture, please? Even okay. in web. So, Russell, can we take the picture? Thank you. Can we open your cameras? Okay. okay. Thank you. And there is a final question. I'm sorry. Um, Professor Eile, you answered the question about how can they go into a uh, training. So this is in the chat box. Professor Eile gave it to you. So thank you everyone for your attention and thank you for keeping up with us. This is the Philippine Society of Therapeutic High Intensity Focused Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology the webinar series number one. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Goodbye, Good Goodbye Good Dr. Raymond. Thank you for Bye. coming. Thank you, nice doctor. Bye, Dr. Bye. Raymond. Nice seeing Bye. you. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. Thanks, Thank you, Professor Dr. Raymond. Thank you. Dr. Raymond. Thank you. Dr. Ailey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. San Juan. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
ultrasound beam can be brought to a tight focus at a distance from its source. With sufficient energy concentrated within the focus, the cells lying within will be killed without damaging the surrounding tissues. High intensity focus ultrasound IFU, is, therefore, a non-invasive method of producing selective and trackless destruction of deeply seated tissue targets within the body without causing any damage to the overlying surrounding tissues. Ultrasound guided high food involves high food ablation under the guidance of real-time ultrasound imaging, which can achieve an uninterrupted visualization of tissue coagulative necrosis during the treatment via grayscale changes in real time. The ablated lesions demonstrate an echogenicity or grayscale changes in the ultrasound images after the sonication, which enables immediate assessment of patient's response to ablation, ensuring a safer and more controllable therapy. Imaging fusion and three-dimension digital reconstruction function provide doctors with a much clearer vision during the whole procedure. Thus, doctors can finish the treatment with an ease. Ultrasound Guided High Food, a new option for the gynecologist to manage uterine fibroids and other gynecological benign tumors, can maximally preserving the integrity of the uterus. No surgery, no bleeding, and no anesthesia. Haifu Knife, applied with FUS-focused ultrasound tumor therapeutic system, allows in vitro ultrasound to enter the body and focus on the lesion, killing only the tumor without destroying any healthy tissue. It doesn't cause a wound or the loss of blood, and patients usually make a quick recovery after treatment. So how, by a few clicks of the mouse, does a doctor finish the treatment? As an example, let's see how the treatment of uterine fibroids is accomplished in five simple steps. Step 1. Locate the fibroids. Unlike a laparoscope, which via hands-on operation reaches and views the fibroids, the Haifu knife uses B-scan ultrasonography to find the fibroids, including those a mere one or two centimeters in diameter. Now, B-scan probe starts to move from the left side of the womb. Good! The left border of the fibroid is shown. Then we record its coordinate, plus 30, then move the probe to detect the fibroid's right border and record its coordinate, minus 20. That's how we find a 5 cm fibroid and determine its position. Step 2. Make a treatment plan. A computer will help us plan out how to kill a 5 cm fibroid. This process is like cutting a potato in slices, except that it's done via a computer. Step 3. Contrast Enhanced Ultrasound. Contrast agents are injected to determine blood perfusion, to estimate the level of difficulty in treatment and to distinguish fibroids from normal tissue for comparison with the result of post-treatment contrast-enhanced ultrasound. Step 4. Treatment. Wait a minute before pulling the trigger, we need to make sure of four things. The proper condition of the patient, a safe acoustic pathway for ultrasound free of intestines, a safe water level and temperature. Focus the point of the Haifu knife aimed right at the target. Done. Now we can begin the treatment. Choose an appropriate degree of treatment, i.e. degree of thermal power, and destroy the fibroid slice by slice according to the treatment plan we made in step two. Now that the fibroid has been killed, all the patient needs is a few painkillers as well as some music and movies. And there's no need to worry about B-scan ultrasonography images because our product is equipped with both 3D magnetic resonance imaging and B-scan ultrasonography to achieve precise positioning and treatment. Step 5. Second time contrast enhanced ultrasound. Apply the contrast agents once again and we will find that the place where the fibroid once existed is no longer highlighted, which means the fibroid has been totally eradicated. That's the end of a successful operation. Isn't it easy and lovely without all the tiring procedures? Even though curing diseases is our duty, we do deserve a pat on the back from time to time. After the operation, nurse the uterus for two hours by cooling it down. Then the patient can begin having water, food and moving around. 
She will be able to return to work in three days. The residual fibroid will be cleared by the immune system. The patient will be able to get pregnant three months after the operation. The Haifu knife means hope for patients and is an important option for doctors. To learn more about the Haifu knife training program, please follow us on our official WeChat account. We are BioFam. We are the leader in women's health care. We've taken the latest breakthroughs to offer you this revolution in progesterone. This is Herogest. It is micronized. Reduced to micrometer particles, Herogest can easily be absorbed by the body. It is natural, sourced from nature. It's identical to the progesterone in the human body. It is revolutionary. It's natural progesterone. It's just what your patients ordered. A revolution in progesterone. Herogest. Micronized. Natural. Available now from BioFound.